Uh, welcome Please. back to the second day of the Doors Open Baltimore Week, uh, celebrating civic pride and industry. My name is Jackson Gilman Forlini. I'm the Historic Preservation Officer for the Baltimore City Department of General Services. We are here today, very exciting, at the Eastern Avenue Pumping Station, which is one of the many buildings, and you'll, you'll see a truck behind me. This is one, by the way, as you can tell. Uh, we are here at one of the many facilities that power Baltimore's wastewater sewage uh, treatment infrastructure. I'm joined today by the operation manager of this facility, Chris Stilper, and I'm also here with Tom Liebel, who is an architect with Mosley Architects and also chair of the Baltimore City Commission on Historic and Architectural Preservation. Uh, if you joined us yesterday at the Vernon Pumping Station, you saw us at sort of the beginning of how water is delivered and taken away in Baltimore. Uh, the Vernon Pumping Station, if you missed the video, you can check it out on the Baltimore Architecture Foundation YouTube page. But there we saw how water is delivered to people's homes. And now we're at the other end of it. We're here to see how water is taken away. That's to say, how do we deal with the problem of sewage removal? And this other building behind us serves a crucial part in that. So could you just about how this building functions and, and what is it doing right now? As water is being used in the residential and the commercial properties within a surrounding area, it is gravity fed through the underground pipelines, fed through this facility, and is pumped uphill to a gravity main, which is then sent gravity to the Back River Wastewater Treatment Plant from where it, the water is treated and put back into the back river for it to be absorbed by the natural uh, life cycle. Okay, very good. And, and how about how much water uh, or sewage is pumped through the station every day? Through this facility, I roughly so 20. What MGD stands for what? Very good. So yeah, gallons per day. 25 million gallons per day are, uh, are, are uh, pumped through this station, is that correct? Yes, sir. That's amazing. Um, is there, do we have a note on our technical? We're we doing good? Okay, great. So, um, Tom, I wanted to ask you too, a little bit about the architecture. Now, yesterday we saw at the Vernon Pumping Station an amazing uh, work of architecture, but here, this is no less amazing. You know, this is building was constructed when? It was built in 1912 uh, as a direct response to the fire of 1904. And uh, what you see here is the same type of thing that, as you know, we discussed yesterday, it was the it was the matter of civic pride that uh, part of the city beautiful movement felt that even the most prosaic infrastructure should be designed uh, with a, a an ennobling effort to try and, and, and make the city look better. And once again, uh, this is also bragging rights that we actually had a sewer system in the early 1900s. A lot of cities didn't. So from that perspective. This was advertising. This was showing off to say what a progressive and advanced city Baltimore was at the time. And, and in terms of architectural style, this is very eclectic, is it not? It is. Uh, it's, it's, it's got a heavier feel to it than the Vernon Pumping Station did. Maybe a little touch of Romanesque to it with the arches and all that, but it really is like everything else, kind of a real grab bag uh, stylistically. Is that Back in the day, it's what they did. One of the things, too, that I think strikes a lot of people is the size of this building. It really dominates the, uh, the, the skyline down here. Uh, and, and when it was constructed, it would have been even more domineering, considering that all of the sky rises, uh, uh, skyscrapers behind it hadn't been constructed yet. Um, and so, you know, why, why is it so big? Well, we'll see in a minute here when we go and look at some of the old historic photographs. It's so big because the IB ran the uh, facility here was so big. It's, um, it is... What they built here was a box to contain the engineering. They built a box to contain all the, the pumps and, and valves and everything that goes in here. And it's just big. As I said, it pumps 20 million gallons a day. It, you need big infrastructure to move that kind of uh, a volume. And yet, even though it's now over 100 years old, it's still functioning. And, uh, and Chris, would you say that this building is still fulfilling its original mission? Absolutely. Yes. All right, so with that, let's go inside and uh, let's take a look at some of the amazing engineering that powers this station. Uh, please follow me, let's go. So as we're walking into the building, we'll see these giant doors, which are covered in copper uh, and surrounded by this uh, granite entablature. 
uh, this is really a, a building that conveys a sense of permanence and durability. It is, um, you know, monumental in the original sense of the word. Uh, so let's go in through the main entrance, uh, which today usually visitors don't get to use. So this is sort of a rare treat for us. Now we're in the main vestibule here, and you can see immediately uh, the ornate details that you see on the exterior continue, right? So we're covered here in um, this beautiful marble paneling on the walls. Uh, and we can also see here on the walls some photographs, some historic photographs of what uh, the machinery used to look like. So uh, maybe, uh, Tom, could you describe a little bit what we're seeing here? And we can get a close sure. up of this, so, of this image. So this is uh, one of the old steam powered pumps uh, back in the day. And if you look at the infrastructure, it's here. We had, you know, there was a uh, was coal delivery and boilers and then these massive steam pumps that um, really filled the space. I think one of the things important to see is these are people here. That's the, the, the scale figures of how big this equipment is. I mean, this, we'll see in a second, it's, it's absolutely massive. It, it filled this entire space up here. Now, uh, if we'll look on the other side of the wall here, uh, here's some additional historic photos of the um, original, uh, well, actually, Chris, what are these? Why don't you describe this to us, what we're seeing? Steam, these are part of the steam pumps okay. as well. And this, so this was steam, this was coal-fired steam. the pistons that okay. are driving, the wheels that are driving, the steam pistons up in every cycle. And in, in what year did these go away? These were, the building was electrified, beginning to be electrified in 1959. Okay. And so now we're going to see uh, and go in and see what is the, the, the current uh, apparatus that drives the pumping station. Uh, now that we've gotten a sense of the height of this, but this is very important to understanding sort of the architectural massing of the building from the exterior. Uh, so follow me and let's go in and we'll take a look at really the, the heart and soul of this station. Okay, so we're coming in now to this enormous open room. And uh, this is really like almost like a cathedral. Uh, and you can see, you know, it's just flooded with natural lights. But you can also get a sense of just how high the ceilings are. And, and in comparison to the historic photos, uh, you really get a good sense of why this building was so, so big. Tom, so would you like to add anything to that? Sure. And actually, what if you pan up to the ceiling there, what you actually see is that's a, that's a false ceiling that's been dropped in here. The entire eave is up, or the, the, the gable is up beyond there. So the, the whole ceiling goes up an extra, you know, 20, 30 feet there. Yeah. But, you know, this big square here, this big hole, that's, um, that's where these massive steam engines used to sit. So right. all, all of these little tiny pumps down there. Used little to, tiny. Yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> so they're probably, speaking. what, six feet tall each, right? Yeah, but, but compared to, to the, you know, the, the 30, 40 foot tall pumps there. Right. And that's only one of the key distinctions between you know, the Eastern uh, Avenue pumping station and the Vernon pumping station from yesterday, this was designed in the age of steam. As I said, it, it was just electrified in the around 1960. Right. It ran 50 years just on steam power. Vernon pumping station was designed and built in 1930 where electric was the uh, the standard of, of, of design at that point. So, and, oh, sorry, go ahead. Say just different, different air required, you know, different physical requirements for the building. Now, and, and actually, too, that raises a good point, because with each era, uh, the technology needs to be upgraded in order to meet the current demands. Uh, and so, uh, Chris, why don't you show us now uh, the current controls uh, that power this station and control the pumps, and then we can take a look at what the older ones look like, which are still in place. So why don't you sh show us over here what the current technology is. Despite being a 100-year-old building, it's actually quite state-of-the-art on the inside. So what do we have here, Chris? This is currently... The HMI, which is Human Interface Module, and it allows the operator to see what is going on at the present time. And up, this computer will actually select which pump to, that the operator desires to run, and it runs through set points, preset set points at water levels into our wet well. So it is set to come on at a certain level and shut off at a certain level. And we will maintain this until the operator decides to change it. Thank you. Now, uh, one thing that you can't uh, experience at home is actually uh, you can tell as soon as you walk in that it's a sewage pumping station based on the smell. Uh, it's not overpowering, but it's, it's definitely there. And, and Chris, you were telling me, how long have you worked in this station? 45 years. 45 years. And do you smell 
anything now? Um, no, I'm immune to it. You're immune to it. <laughs> All right. I guess that will happen after 45 years. Thank you for your service to the city of Baltimore. We're really happy to have uh, such a veteran working here and, and knowing the station so intimately. Uh, so with that, let, why don't we cross over the catwalk and you can kind of get another angle. Uh, as behind us here, you can also see uh, the not plaque, but the inscription on the wall uh, commemorating the creation of this building. Um, this, as you said, Tom, this was a major public works project. This was a, uh, a full court press in terms of getting the capital and the, the, the labor together to put this together. It did, absolutely. Because you know, prior to this, we had no sewage system at all. Right. So it was getting, first of all, you had to get the the support behind it because this was an expensive proposition. So they had to do the political lift of funding it. Right. Then they had to go in and it wasn't just building this building. They had to extend all these pipes everywhere. They, you know, so this is just, this is the midpoint of the process where sewage flows out of the houses, which all those pipes were new. And, and then as Chris was saying, from here it gets pumped up to flow out the back river. They had to build that too. So this is a heavy, heavy lift, no pun intended. Back early 1900s, once again, that the uh, the the fire and the devastation of 1904 cleared out this entire swath of the city and kind of gave them the opportunity to plan thoughtfully for this infrastructure. Because without the the wholesale demolition of the downtown there, it would have been that much more difficult to lay the lines and find the site to make all this happen. And actually, um, we, let's take a look. There's a, a, an original blueprint on the wall over here. Let's take, quickly take a look at that before we move on. So that the viewers at home can see, uh, really, that the design for this place was not just utilitarian. It was a work of art. This was something that was uh, done, or uh, the decisions were made to make it most aesthetically pleasing uh, for the time. Isn't that right? Absolutely. This was not just a, uh, a piece of industrial infrastructure that was going to be, you know, sort of put to the back, uh, you know, the, not, uh, not thought through fully to give this sort of sense of, of, of massive design that this was this was a matter of civic pride this right. was uh this was baltimore saying that they were a modern uh modern city with the latest and greatest of amenities now before we get too ahead of ourselves we should also probably let the folks at home know who the architect was uh since we missed that last time i don't know okay <laughs> I, uh, I haven't seen it i haven't seen that listed it's clear they had one but this was uh mainly run once again through a bunch of engineers Luckily, I can see the architect's name on the blueprint, and it is Henry Bronze. Uh, so there we, there we go, right there. Um, his his uh, signature is right still on the blueprint on the wall today. So, so unlike the Vernon Pumping Station, I don't see the architect listed here at all in the plaques. It's all about the engineers because yes. that was the important part of this. Right. Let's move on, and we can take a look at some of the original control systems, or at least the original to the 1960s electrification of the plant. Uh, there you see also the, uh, the inscription on the wall with the people who put this together. All right, and we're going to go across the catwalk now. And as we're walking across, uh, we'll just take a look and a better view over here of the, um, the pumps. All right, and here we have, there's the other side of the catwalk. You can see there are how many pumps running here, Chris? Right now, there's only one running. One running, but how many do you have in total? We have five pumps total. Five pumps total. Six pump is a, actually a standby pump that is no longer in use. Okay. That used to pump in emergencies in the old days. When if any of these pumps failed or there was an electric failure, that six pump used to be driven by four diesel engines, which would in turn pump it but the big no-no is that it would pump it straight through the harbor. Well, of course, that is no longer environmentally acceptable practice. So that has been, function has been deleted. So in the event, whatever the situation is, we have five pumps to take care of whatever flow is presented at that particular time. In the old days, the operator would use these controls to select whichever pump that he wanted to use, depending on what he was seeing here. This was the, as I said before, the computer picks the pumps now, depending on the level. Well, in the old days, back in the early 
60, the operator would pick the pump depending on what he was seeing with this gauge here. This is our present digital gauge, and this is old school pressure gauge. So, but depending on what he was seeing here, he would select one of these pumps. And as you notice, each of these pumps are of different sizes. So the more flow, the bigger pump he would, he would select to put on. The lower flow, he would choose a smaller pump. Thank you. All right, let's, um, let's head back to the uh, uh, next room in which you can see where the electrical supply is for the building. So now we're coming around and on your, our left, you'll see again the pumps from a different angle. And then also to this sort of arcading foundation uh, at the bottom, which is supporting the, the, the weight of the building. Now we're back here in the electrical room. And uh, what is the, uh, Chris, what does the electrical supply look like for this, for this, uh, for this station? This is a 480 volt uh, MCC panel that feeds the power to fi all five of the motors that are driving the pump. Fantastic. This panel is fed from the main generation power, which is outside. And we can look at that if you would like to. Well, this is the main feed to the pump panel and whatever we may need, power we need to operate the motors to, for each pump. So what are some of the challenges uh, in, associated with working in a hundred year old building with new technology? Uh, well, the biggest challenge is integrating the new technology to mate with the older technology. That's, that's the big challenge for engineers, trying to make the new with the old. And of course there's restrictions on just what they can do. Of course. It only goes so far. All right. I, I imagine that it's probably not easy, but also too, that there's a lot of good things about this building, right? That, that you can use from the past. Uh, absolutely. I'm an old school guy. And I think personally, I think they should have stuck with the old technology, <laughs> but that's another story, uh, another video. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, why don't we head to the back and then we can see the smokestack uh, that was originally powering the steam engine. Uh, no, we're, we're going to skip that for today. All right, so we're coming out to the back uh, of, the, uh, of the pumping station, which is where we have, the, of course, the employees parking lot. Uh, but from here, we can get a, a pretty good view of the building, which is not something that folks normally see. Uh, and we can also see in a second, you're about to see the uh, smokestack. As we said earlier, this was originally uh, powered by steam engines that were fired by coal. Uh, and so the smokestack from the photographs that I saw were, was much larger originally. Isn't that right, Tom? Yeah, it was much taller. And then I'm sure when they didn't need to have the smokestack work anymore, the tops of smokestacks tend to fail more quickly than the bottom, so we'll take it down until, it, until it's a safe course level. Okay, okay. Now, I'm noticing there's a giant ladder uh, kind of uh, bolted into the side of that smokestack. Chris, do you, do you ever use that ladder? Do the folks here ever use that? No one I've ever seen climb that ladder. <laughs> it's, it's probably not OSHA compliant, right? Obviously not. I think, I think this is a, a legacy of, of the building's uh, construction, so we're not, we're not using that anymore. Um, but, you know, we can also get a sense, too, of, you know, just from the, from the smokestack that this is truly an industrial building. It's, it's not just purely decorative, but it, it has a, uh, an industrial legacy to it. Isn't that right? It does. But once again, even though it, was, it had its industrial legacy to it, you can still look at it and see it was, even the smokestack was thoughtfully designed. It was designed uh, with an architectural eye to it. That it wasn't just the easiest way to build a smokestack, but we have a base here. You have some additional architectural detailing, the archway before it steps up to there. You've got the cornice line around there. You've got the little connecting bridge that ties it into the main building. That was all, you know, you, did, you didn't have to do that. Right. But it was certainly the right thing to do. Um, now, Tom, too, I should mention, uh, is an expert on this in part because he literally wrote the book on it. Um, Tom Liebel's book, uh, Industrial Baltimore, uh, chronicles uh, in much more detail, if any of you are interested in this, some of the, the stories and the design decisions that went into uh, industrial architecture in Baltimore. Isn't that right? It is. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun working on that book. I, I do a lot of work with adaptive use projects 
and have spent enough time walking in a lot of old buildings that uh, I really wanted to try and capture what they used to be because now today so many of them are something different or they've changed dramatically. So if you look at the book, it's available a lot of different places. Find bookstores uh, everywhere, right? Find bookstores everywhere. But that you actually see the original photograph that's under construction. You see photos of the steam engines. You can see uh, photos of the smokestack when it's its full height. And it sort of gives you a sense of how it's changed over time. Let's take a little uh, walk further away from the building so that everyone can see, sort of see the full size of it. And then I think it'll be time for some Q&A. So let's just uh, take a step back here. And then we'll be able to um, get a look at the, the dormers and some of the fine architectural detailing on the roof, which includes uh, copper flashing. Uh, and I believe, is this, this is a slate roof, is it not? Yes, it it's is. A slate, it's a slate roof. Slate roof. And, uh, you know, it, it's not just an accident that this is still here today. Uh, it takes, um, every, with every generation, it takes a renewal and maintenance and preservation uh, to keep this place going. And I understand, Chris, that uh, there's actually additional improvements that are being scheduled uh, for the near future. Is that correct? Absolutely. It underwent a capital improvement project in 2008. Some items on the slate roof were addressed. Uh, to speak to uh, the earlier thing about how we meld the, uh, the old processes into the new, the smokestack is actually now being used as an air vent to vent the fumes from the well, well up, out through the stack now, so it can be ventilated up into the atmosphere as opposed. So they, they repurposed the smokestack. So it's still, fun I didn't realize that, that's fascinating. It's still functional, it's not just an artifact. Everything, is, everything goes to use. Uh, in addition to, um, after the Q&A, we'll have a chance to hear from the folks who are running the Public Works Experience, which is a, uh, a chance to revitalize what used to be the Public Works Museum at this location. And so uh, stay tuned after the Q&A to, to hear a little bit about that. Uh, but at this point, I think I'd like to turn it over to you. Um, and if it, any of you have questions, uh, please type them in the chat box. And then um, I think Margaret will then uh, read them back to us uh, and, and we'll be able to hear them. So uh, please go right ahead. Hey there, it's, uh, it's Nathan taking over for the questions today. Um, actually, the first question we have is about the public waiting, works experience. Um, and I remember going- hey, uh, Actually, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's give them a chance because they have to read the questions. So they'll um, take over. I remember going to the old Public Works Museum as a kid, and I know that there's the Public Works Experience, which is now um, underway. So Rachel Ellis is with us, who is with the Public Works Experience. And Rachel, can you tell us a little bit about what's what's going on with that? And can people actually go to the museum anytime soon? Thank you, Nathan. Uh, no, the museum is closed. Uh, we um, we hope to reopen someday, but our plan is to do a, a complete rehab of what was the Public Works Museum, which would require adding an additional floor. Um, it's a very small space right now, about 5,000 square feet. And so to really cover all of Public Works in a meaningful and engaging way, uh, it's gonna take quite a bit of work to do that. Um, we do have some minor displays right now. We participated in Doors Open last year also, um, but, um, and so we'll be using the space for fundraising and we can talk about that shortly. Thank you. Okay, I have uh, my first question here um, about the site. Uh, given that the bumping station is in such uh, a, a high profile location, um, as a site uh, that's really desirable for development, how is the pumping station kept protected? Okay, so yes, how is it being protected from development given the fact that the real estate market is very hot in this area? Um, well, one immediate thought that comes to mind is that this is a Baltimore City landmark, is it not, Tom? It is. And so because of that, it falls under uh, CHAP's jurisdiction. And you know, we review any proposed modifications to it because we would make sure it's preserved for future generations. And, you know, and, and in, in keeping with that, um, some of the things that we discussed yesterday is that it, it also is not just CHAP. It also uh, is uh, DPW as the owner of the property. And they begin, whenever they undertake any kind of modification, they begin in consultation with an architect or engineer to consider these things to make sure that the historic integrity uh, is preserved. And, and Chris, as far as I know, uh, uh, it's uh, the, the desire uh, for DPW to keep this building going as long as it possibly can. Is that right? Absolutely. Because where would you place a facility required 
the size of the facility required to replace it. That's right. You'd have to be in this area somewhere. So I don't know, see here how you would relocate it. That'd be pretty tough to do. That's right. That's right. Yeah, the location is dictated by the engineering. So it's really a perfect blend of, of both form and function. All right. Uh, well, how about another question? What happened to the old pump? What happens to that, all that uh, gear that was switched out that we saw in the pictures? Uh, Chris, do you know, or Tom, do you know what happened to the old equipment? I'm guessing it was scrapped because it was, it was metal and it was probably worth, you know, five cents a pound. <laughs> yeah, so we, we don't know, unconfirmed, but if anyone out there wants to uh, do some research, uh, please let us know. All right, how about another question? We've got an engineering question here. It's, uh, what are the current pump sizes and are they variable frequency drives? Uh, repeat that last part. Oh, yeah. Currently, these pumps are across the line, uh, solid standard size motors. These are not VFDs. In the new capital improvement project, the city is exploring the idea of moving the VFDs. There are five pumps here, and they range in size from 25 to 40 MGD. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Take another question. Next question is, uh, do you have an idea of where they source the brick to build the building? Ah, the brick. Well, it is beautiful, isn't it? Uh, Tom, do you know where the brick might have been sourced from? Uh, not specifically, although I would expect it would be uh, made fairly locally because brick's heavy and expensive to ship. So most masonry is, is, is uh, located and brought in from a place fairly nearby. And then, you know, you raise a good point, too, which is about location and transportation. Um, the, the, the location is perfect in terms of, of bringing things in via railroad, historically, as well as uh, from the harbor, too. So that's why they, they would have brought the coal in from there, for right. one, that they had to. In fact, there was a big chute that came down there, and they loaded it up to the top there. It was all done off of, was that Pier 6? Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, any other questions? Um, last question I have here is, where are the valves and how are they operated? The valves. All right, Chris, tell us more about the valves and how they're operated. Each pump has its own set of valves. And as the pump is called for, the pump will start and the valve will begin to open a few seconds before the motor is fired up to its capacity. Uh, um, elect, uh, uh, capacity. And as the valve is speeding, as the pump is motoring up, the valve is opening, thus allowing a smooth transition for the flow to be pu pulled up from the wet well out into the discharge side of the pump. So there's a, uh, there are no suction valves here. So we have what we call a vacuum system, which actually pulls the water up into the pump and then allows the discharge side to function electrically. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much for your questions and for joining us today. Uh, we're really very happy uh, that you've come along on this exciting tour as part of Doors Open Baltimore. Uh, please be sure to check out all the other programming that's going on throughout the rest of October. Uh, I will be giving another tour on Saturday of the Roland Water Tower at uh, 12 o'clock. So please be sure to join again uh, for that. And um, a special thank you to the Baltimore Architecture Foundation for putting on Doors Open Baltimore. And a big thank you to the Baltimore City Department of Public Works and the Baltimore City Department of General Services. Uh, my name is Jackson Gilman Forlini. Again, I'm here with Tom Liebel of Mosley Architects and the uh, Baltimore City Commission on Historic and Architectural Preservation. And of course, Chris Stilper, who is the operations manager of the Eastern Avenue Pumping Station. Uh, thank you and we will see you again soon. And please be sure to stay on the line for additional information about the Public Works experience. Thank you and have a great rest of your day. Hey, thanks. And, and Rachel, if you have any, any last words. Well, thanks everybody. I'll make this as quick as I can. Um, my name is Rachel Ellis. I'm the executive director of Public Works Experience. Um, we're actually located in that back portion of the building in what was the old boiler room. Um, the museum opened in 1982. Uh, it was 
closed in 2010. Um, it was started as an independent 501c3 by the city um, and their Department of Public Works um, and had to close due to budget cuts. They operated it, um, but it is an independent 501c3. It's incorporated in Maryland and it has a private board of directors, um, which continues to this day working diligently to try to reopen the space as the public works experience. Um, we don't want to be a museum necessarily. We'd rather uh, engage the public and teach them about public works today and how it affects everyone's daily lives. Um, topics that we do want to cover are water, drinking water, storm water, and of course sanitation, which is the whole purpose of the building that we're homed in. Um, transportation, which roads and bridges and tunnels, the infrastructure that we need to move around, um, as well as power, energy, and communications. Also public works or public, um, publicly regulated utilities that we depend on every day. Um, Several years ago, we completed a master plan to where we uh, again shifted our focus from to decide that we didn't want to be a museum. We'd rather engage and talk about forward facing and the, the services that we all depend on. Um, but it would require that we actually gut that portion of the building and build a second floor, which I believe I mentioned briefly earlier. Um, and it comes with a very expensive price tag, many millions of dollars, um, and which we don't have. Uh, but so we conducted uh, several studies with the city. Um, one was to determine could we actually raise the needed money in a capital campaign in today's environment, which we demonstrated, yes, we think we can do that. Um, the other important study was an operations study. If the city doesn't fund the staffing and the upkeep of, of a new experience like this, could we be a sustainable business on our own? And that study was also demonstrated that, yeah, you know, if any business is only as good as the people that run it, but based on the location and the content, um, the partnerships that we can build in the area. Yes, we are, are confident that this would be a sustainable business that could operate without the direct support from the Department of Public Works. Um, so today, what we're working on uh, is we're working to continue to expand our board of directors. Right now, the majority of people are from the architect engineering and construction community. We need to broaden our base and expand a little bit more into more representation from, uh, from finance and from legal and other partners that can help us raise the, the millions of dollars that we're going to need. We're also finishing our founding members campaign, which for $3,000, um, a founding member will be permanently recognized in the public works experience. Um, we set the, the cap at 50 founding members. We currently have 43. So for a whopping $3,000, um, an individual or a company can become a founding member and we would truly welcome that. Uh, we'd love to get rid of those last seven empty slots. Um, and finally, just to wrap up, we are looking into plans for a fundraiser for 2021. Um, we do have a great outdoor space. We're right on the promenade. Um, and so we're, we're starting to kick around some ideas of what we might do to, for a fundraiser. So if anybody's interested, we have a website at www.pwexperience.org. That's pwexperience.org. You can reach me there. My email is on the website. Um, and if there's questions, uh, we're here. Okay, thank you, Rachel. And I hope that uh, by this time next year, we'll have doors open Baltimore in person and we can have people back inside. It's such a great space. And I wish you the best of luck with, with the campaign. And we'll hopefully see everyone on Saturday for our climb of the Roland Water Tower. Uh, thank you.